Well, good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, I want to invite you at this time to open a Bible with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, we're in verses 9 through 14 uh, this morning. I've been wondering all week and kind of praying for this Sunday and this moment in particular, and I've been kind of curious to imagine almost what you would say if I were to ask you this simple question. And that question is this, how does God feel about you, like right now? I wonder as you went about your week, as you drove here, you got yourself ready, you got here, you got your coffee or whatever. We sang the songs, we prayed the prayers, now you're sitting here. Like in this moment, how does God feel about you? Um, maybe, maybe you'd say it differently. What is God's disposition towards you? What is his countenance towards you this morning? Maybe more importantly, how in the world do you determine that? How do you determine that? Do you just make it up? Do you kind of wish yourself into what you hope it is? Or do you just linger in what you dread it might be? You know? I think for most of us, we probably answer that question, um, you know, and how we determine that, potentially just based upon the kind of week we had. You know, like if you in your mind felt like you had a really good week, uh, maybe you like read your Bible every day and you prayed and those were really sweet times. Uh, or, you know, you had an opportunity to share the gospel and you did, you know, you put yourself out there and uh, you, you can't believe you did it, you know. Or, uh, I don't know, maybe you struggle with some certain sin in your life. You know, that one sin that you find yourself confessing the most over and over to God. It's just like a weekly, maybe daily confession almost. And this week, you're like, wow, I didn't have to confess that one time. It was a good week, you know? And so maybe you walk in here and you're like, God's smile is upon me. You know, I had a great week. Or maybe you had a bad week, you know? Like, if you're being honest, you drove away from campus last week, and you had in your mind all these great intentions about what you're going to do and how you're going to live your life, and then as you were driving back here this morning, it kind of dawned on you that you're like, man, if I'm being honest, I didn't really think about God all week. I never even thought to open my Bible and pray or anything like that. Or you had an opportunity to share the gospel, and you really dodged it. You know, you kind of made up an excuse or something. It was really awkward. Uh, or maybe that thing that you struggle with the most was just, it was a bad week in that area of your life. Or you just made a mess of your life this week and you almost didn't want to come today because you're just so devastated by the ruin that you find a certain relationship in or something like that. And so when you think about that question, how does God feel about you right now? You're like, I have no idea, but he's probably distant. It's probably cold towards me, uh, pr pretty upset. I don't even know if he loves me anymore, right? What's going on in these scenarios, I think, is this basic insecurity that you and I struggle with around whether or not we believe we are right with God. It's an insecurity about whether or not we're right with God, if we can even know if we're right with God. And so Jesus says to us this morning, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about two men and how they both dealt with that deep underlying problem, the one that I just laid out for you, okay? So beginning in verse 9, Jesus tells his disciples this parable, or he tells it to everyone who's there. It says specifically to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men, here's the story, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Before we get into uh, the points that you have like on your outline and everything, I just want to explain what this story is doing. It's really important we understand what this story is doing. Okay, so we have two men in our story, and they both do two things, right? Do you see it? They both go up to the temple to pray in verse 10, and they both go home in verse 14. And they both have a similar desire. They want to be right with God. They want to be right with God. We know this is their desire based upon what we are told they say at the temple. So their agenda is to go to the temple and go home with this sense, this security, that they are right with the God who made them and who ultimately they're accountable to. Only one of these men, though, is going to leave right with God. Who's your money on? Who's your money on? I mean, don't bet, really. But if we were, you know, who's your money on? Is it on the Pharisee? right? The Pharisee, we see him in verse 10. Uh, These are people who lived their lives in such a way that they tried to make themselves right with God by keeping the law, right? The word Pharisee means set apart. These literally were people known as the separated ones, okay? Uh, It's important to know that the Pharisee was like thought of as the model citizen in society, I know for any of us who've been familiar with the Bible or if you've read the end of the story, we read Pharisee and we think the bad guy, right? But if you were living in this time or if you were the first people to pick up Luke's manuscript and read it, um, you would have thought very differently, actually. You would look at the Pharisee as the model. He's the model guy, right? He's the guy that if he walked in here this morning, you'd be so thrilled, that he was actually here and you'd greet him and welcome him and tell him, man, it's such an honor to have you. Hey, come over here and sit with me. You know, you'd be quick to point this person out. We're so honored today to have so-and-so with us. You know, it's this kind of person. And then you have the tax collector, right? The tax collector, the other end of the spectrum, who would have been hated by the Jewish people, Because the tax collectors, they were in cahoots with the Roman Empire, the the Roman Empire that came in and conquered Israel, right? That that came in and and, and made them subject to their new empire. And so what they would do, what Caesar would do, is he would take regions that they had conquered and they would franchise them out to people. And they would say, we want to collect taxes from this region. And if you wanted to go and collect taxes and make some money, you would bid on it. And the highest bidder got to go collect taxes from that region. But what you would do as a Jewish person, you would go to that region, you would say, hey, you owe $7, but you need to give me 14 or something like that. You'd basically collect what you needed to give to Caesar, but you would add for more, ask for more so that you could make some money off of it. And these were your people. They like, were people that you looked at and thought of as people who betrayed you, right? Because they were helping out and even benefiting off the people who just conquered you. These are are like the most hated people, basically, in this society. So here's the thing. If you were a parent, you would tell your kids, hey, do you look over there and see that tax collector? Don't grow up and be like him. (coughs) Do you see that Pharisee over there? That's the model. That's the model, right? But only one of these people goes home justified. And it's not the Pharisee. It's not the religious guy. This is very disorienting to us. Surely the Pharisee tried his best, right? I mean, surely he he lived and died if he did so in Redlands. And we were to have a funeral for the Pharisee. The pastor would stand up and say, this man is now in the presence of God for all eternity. He is in heaven. And everyone there would just confidently agree with those pastor's words. I mean, this guy tried hard. He was very moral. Shouldn't that be enough to please God? How could he go home? And I don't say this tritely. How could he go home on his way to hell while he's thinking he's on his way to heaven? Not justified, not right with God. This is a devastating and disorienting story. And guys, one of the reasons why we're doing this series 
in Redlands as it is in heaven. So we're asking, what does it look like if the kingdom of God actually were to come, if we're actually to pray for the kingdom of God to come? The reason we're asking this question is because the way the world works is so opposite often of the way the kingdom of God works. See, most of us think that what God wants from us is simply that we're good, that we just be good. But Jesus is saying that good people are going to miss out on God altogether. That's the shock. The Pharisee leaves with God as his enemy, not with God as his friend. Only the tax collector leaves with the security that no one can steal. And so Jesus is is using this story to hold up a mirror to all of us today, and he's saying, you're in this story too. You and I are in this story too. He's holding up a mirror and saying this, how do you relate to God? How do you relate to God? What do you do with your guilt? And we want to look in that mirror carefully because our souls are at stake. And so what we will learn is we're going to learn one thing from each character, and then we're going to ask a question at the end. So we're going to learn one thing from each character, and the first is we're going to look at the Pharisee. And what we learn from this Pharisee is, number one, you are never, you are never, never beyond the need of God's grace. You are never beyond the need of God's grace. We see two signs that this Pharisee has that he believes, in some sense, he, he's beyond the need. He doesn't need God's grace. And what is that? Number one, it's in your outline. It's confidence in self. He's very confident in himself. We see this in verse 12. But look back in verse 11, because what does it say? It says, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Verse 11 begins literally by saying the Pharisee took up his position in the temple, and it literally says he prayed to himself. He prayed to himself. He prayed towards himself. This is what it's saying. The focus is not at all on God. It's on himself. I mean, notice even his prayer. The first word is what? God... And then I takes over. The, the, he mentions the word I and no more God for the rest of the prayer. And it's a very short prayer, but he says I five times. Five times in two lines. Well, what does he say about himself since that's the focus of his prayer? He says, I'm nailing this religious thing. Like I'm nailing this whole moral living thing. Right? I fast from food twice a week. So he's like, I'm, I get bonus points with God because a Jewish person was only required to fast one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and I'm doing it twice a week. No food, guys. I'm not eating, right? So that means I'm going above and beyond 103 days a year, right? I'm doing pretty good, right? Then he seems to be doing well in some other big categories of morality that are really important to abide by. What does he say in verse 11? I don't steal things. I don't rob people not a thief. I'm not an evildoer, which is just a big general category for living your life. And then lastly, he doesn't cheat on his wife, which is a great thing, right? I'm sure his wife would agree. But finally, he says, I give a tenth of all of the things that I receive, all the resources I have. I, I give some of it away. I always give to the temple. I always give to the work of God. I always give to ministry. But I'm generous. But what does Jesus say he's doing? Look at, verse four, look at verse 14, the summary of the story. He is exalting himself. He's exalting himself. That's how Jesus describes what he's doing. He's exalting himself. Through this act of prayer, he isn't even praying at all. He's just lifting himself up. Charles Spurgeon uh, tells this story of a poor uh, peasant carrot farmer in rural England. And one day, this poor farmer dug up the largest carrot he had ever harvested. It was enormous. And he thought to himself, this carrot is only befit for a king. And so he goes to the king's palace, and he gets an audience with the king, and he goes and he lays this massive carrot down before this king. And he says to the king, you have always been such a wonderful, fair, and gracious king, and I love you very much. As a token of my love for you, I want you to have this carrot. It is a gift which you truly deserve. The king was really touched by this. 
And he said, thank you for this gift. I happen to own all the farmland surrounding your tiny little farm, and I would like to give you all that land as a gift. Please know it's just a small token of my love for you. It was amazing. You give him a carrot and you get all this farmland in return. You know, he was like, oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting that, you know, this sort of thing. And there was a nobleman in the court that day who saw this exchange and he thought to himself, man, if the king would give that much land for a carrot, what would he give for a really nice gift? And so the nobleman goes out that night and he finds the most majestic horse he's ever seen. And the next day he brings it to the king's palace and he says to the king, oh king, you are so wonderful and I just want to demonstrate my love for you as king. And so because of that, I wanted to give you this majestic horse. And the king was really wise and he saw right through it all. And this is what he said. He said, yesterday, the poor farmer gave a carrot for me. And today, you give a horse for yourself. You give a horse for yourself. That's what this guy's doing. He's praying to exalt himself, right? The first mark of thinking we're beyond the need of God's grace is having this confidence in ourself, and it comes by way of the second mark, and that is comparison to others. Comparison to others. When I have this confidence in what I'm doing, to make myself acceptable to God, it always comes through comparison. I don't know if you've thought about this. When I feel confident in who I am, it always, that confidence comes only by way of comparison. Our confidence in ourselves comes through our comparison to other people. I want you to think about it this way. We, we often think the Pharisee is probably just a good guy, but he has, he has a dark room of guilt too. I think about it this way. When people come over to your house, every, you all have a room, don't you? That you just throw everything in to clean it up, to make it look like your house is clean, you know? Or your apartment or dorm room. You all have a place, a closet, something under your bed. You throw all the things so that it looks like things are clean, right? All of us have a room like this. And it's actually true of our hidden hearts as well. It's just as true in our memory banks and things like that. There's a famous 1999 film starring Matt Damon called The Talented Mr. Ripley. And there's kind of this famous scene where Matt Damon, named, playing Tom Ripley, says this to his friend Peter. He says, don't you just take the past and put it in a room in the basement and lock the door and never go in there? And Peter said, oh, yes, though in my case, it's probably a whole house. And Matt Damon says, then you meet someone special and all you want to do is toss them the key and say, open up, step inside. But you can't because it's dark and there are demons. And if anybody saw how ugly it was, and then he pauses, he says, I, I keep wanting to do that, fling the door open and just let the light in and clean everything out, but I can't, I can't. Here, here's the thing that he's talking about. We all have that. We all have guilt, right? We all have a dark room of guilt. And, and, and we also each have a dark room of guilt in our hearts where we stuff all the guilt and all the shame. And we try to keep the key to that door hidden from others so that no one can open it. And the Pharisee even has that. How does he deal with his guilt? It's by putting other people down. It's by comparing himself to other people. That's how he deals with his guilt. I'll just make it a relative thing. I've got to keep pushing other people down. Like this is why we, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, this is why we compare ourselves to other people all the time. Because if I think I'm better than you, then I feel better about who I am. If I criticize you, if I put you down, if I slander your name, if I start gossiping about you, right? What is, why am I doing that? It's so that I can feel better about who I am. Do, do you see what he says? God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. That's how I cope. That's how I cope. I'm certainly not like the people in Hollywood, right? I'm certainly not like the drug addict that's strung out on the streets. I'm certainly not like that guy at work who cheated on his wife and kind of brags about it. 
I'm certainly not like that other mom who just lets her kids do whatever, and they're crazy, and she's just ruining their life with her chaotic drama. I'm certainly not like that person who mishandles their money, and I'm certainly not like that person who's advocating for the political candidate next Tuesday who's clearly the wrong choice. So I put you down, and as I put you down, I pat myself on the back. And here's the scary thing. As I'm patting myself on the back, I mistakenly believe it's actually God's hand that is patting my back. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not like them but it's not the hand of God. Do you see how this works? I try to hide my guilt by saying, oh, don't look over there. Not in that room. Look over there at that person's room. Don't look at me. Look at the tax collector. He he thinks he's in a different category than other people, but he's picking who he compares himself to. Right? Here's the thing. You can always find someone to compare yourself to that will make you feel better, you guys. You can always find someone who you think you're better than, to compare yourself to, to feel better about your own guilt. There's always somebody who sins differently than you do in a way that you don't. It feels relative. When I was growing up, I first lived in a little town in Montana called Deer Lodge. It's where the state prison was. It was a tiny town. But we still had other cities around us that were smaller than us, okay? Uh, Because we had like an A&W, you know, in a Super 8 motel. And so we were like big time, you know. But when I was six, we moved to Helena, which was the, is the capital. And we thought it was like massive. You know, it was the big city, the big time. And it is one of the largest cities in Montana. And when I moved to Helena, I was like, oh, Deer Lodge is a small town, right? But did you know that if you take all the surrounding area of Helena, it is the same size of population as Redlands, right? Pretty much. Redlands is actually, I think, a little bit bigger, Right? But here in Redlands, we don't think we're a big city. We think we're a nice town, you know? Why? Because we can compare ourselves to like San Bernardino and Riverside. You know, we even have places like Los Angeles and Anaheim and San Diego nearby that are massively populated cities that give perspective on how big we really are, you know? But you know, if you plop Redlands in Montana, it would be like the fifth or third somewhere in their largest city in Montana. That's how big we would be. We would be giants, you guys. We would be like massive urban centers of life, you know, in Montana. But here in California, we're 124th on the list, right? You know what I'm saying? You can find anybody to compare yourself to to give you definition to who you are, right? This is how this works. C.S. Lewis said this, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something, something that is above you. You cannot see something that is above you. So I simply want to ask you this morning, who do you compare yourself to? Who do you compare yourself to? Who do you think you're better than? It might be the people who just make a mess of their life, but you actually go to the other extreme and be more compassionate towards those people and go, well, at least I'm not like one of those judgmental people, right? We can do both. I mean, here's how deep this goes. When I read this story initially this week, do you want to know what my first thought was? God, I'm so thankful that I'm not like the Pharisee. <laughs> Completely vulnerable with you. Guys, the point is you are never beyond the need of God's grace. Even if you think you are, or you just need a sprinkle of it, if that's where your heart is, if that's where your mind is, do you know what that means? It all it means is that you've become confident in yourself, and the only reason you're confident in yourself is because you're comparing yourself to other people. That's it. But secondly, there's a tax collector. Don't worry, we move quicker from here. The tax collector, and here in this character, this is what we learn. We learn that you are never beyond the reach of God's grace. You are never beyond the reach of God's grace. Look at what he's doing. The tax collector, verse 13, is standing far off. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, 
a sinner, and I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. He didn't. He's standing far off. He doesn't take up his position in the temple to pray in a performative way. He's standing far off, and he won't even look up to heaven. He's looking down. Why is he looking down? Because he's already tried to look up. That's the idea. He has been comparing himself, just like the Pharisee, but he's been comparing himself to the one person that you are supposed to compare yourself to, and that is God himself. He has compared himself to God. See, we can falsely think that the goal of, is not comparison, but you're always going to compare yourself. But the humble person compares themselves to God. That's when the shift begins to happen. This humility begins to happen in your life. And so here he is. He's standing at a distance. He doesn't feel like he belongs. He won't even look up to heaven. He beat his chest. He doesn't prop himself up. He buries his head and he cries for mercy. He knew how worthy and holy God is. He knew that all of his sins had piled up, whether they were really embarrassing sins or whether they were the the more uh, respectable sins that you and I all just go, yeah, we all deal with that, right? He knew that God knew everything about his life. He knew that God knew all of his motivations. He knew God knew all of the actions that he had done in public, all the actions that he had done in the secret place. Every word that he's ever said, he knew had landed on God's ear and every thought he'd had, he knew God had seen it. And so this guy says in verse 13, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the text literally says, the sinner, the sinner. He has such a heart attitude that he would say, if you want to see someone of human rebellion, it's me. If you want to see someone who's pushed God aside and taken center stage in their life, I'm exhibit A. He doesn't go, well, look at that guy. He's the sinner. I'm a sinner. No, he goes, I'm the example. Like, look no further. Have mercy on me then, oh God. Propitiate your judgment somewhere else. That's what this image actually is. It's like the idea of rain pouring on you and saying, God, have mercy on me. Propitiate your judgment on somewhere else. Like, have the rain fall somewhere else. It's like those old cartoons You know where you see the character walking around, they have a cloud just above their own head with the rain falling down and everyone else around them is sunny, you know, and they're just so depressed and melancholy and whatever. And it's just that idea, it's that picture, it's the rain is falling on me, please let it fall somewhere else. He says, the room in my house that I've tried to keep hidden from everyone is dark. And I want you, God, to come in and clean house because I want to be right with you. I want to be right with you. And I need it to be cleaned because you know, you know in in just your regular life that if someone's going to come over, you're going to clean your house. And just think, if someone's going to come and stay in your house, you clean it up all the more, don't you? If someone's going to come and live in your house, you get it all ready. You dial it to the nines, right? Especially the more important the person they are. We all know the more important somebody is to you, the cleaner you're going to make your room for them, right? You're going to try to impress them. So just imagine, you have a dark room of guilt in your heart, and you want the God of the universe who's holy and perfect and just to come and take up residence in your life? I can't clean up that mess. I don't even know where to begin. You ever seen a room that bad? You're like, where do I start? And that's the point. The only response, have mercy on me, O oh God. Let it fall somewhere else. And so here's the picture. They're at the temple, right? And so the tax collector's there in the temple. And if he were to have looked up, guess what he would have saw? He would have looked up and he would have seen the altar. That's what he would have seen. The animals that would have been brought in and killed for sin. So every Jewish household, they would bring an unblemished lamb to be killed. And the youngest member of the Jewish household would ask this, why would the lamb be killed? And the response to that child would be, we deserve to die for our sin, but God has allowed that lamb to be killed in our place as our substitute. 
And so as the tax collector shouted out, have mercy on me, O God, he would have been able to see the blood. He would have seen the blood to pay for sin because only death by a spotless substitute could make your heart spotless, clean. The only way to be justified, the only way to have our guilt dealt with is to look to the spotless lamb, to look to Jesus who a ways down in this same chapter in in verse 31, he tells his disciples, guys, we're going to go to Jerusalem now and everything is going to be fulfilled. They're going to kill me there. I'm going to die on a cross as the lamb for sin. My blood will be shed in Jerusalem because I am the lamb of God and I will die. Guys, what do you see when you see Jesus going to Jerusalem to die? When you hear that story, what do you hear? What do you see? Do you see him going to Jerusalem to die there for you? Do you see him going there because the only way, the only way to make you right with God was by dying in your place? for your actual dark room? Do do you see him doing that for you? See, I don't know what the worst thing is in this tax collector's private room that he's thrown away all of his guilt in. And I don't know what's in yours. Right? But God knows. And it's a mark of our humility that we've actually compared ourselves to the right person when we genuinely cry out, have mercy on me. And when that happens, look at the verdict. Look at God's verdict over this man. Jesus says what I tell you, tune in, he's saying I tell you this man was accepted. He was justified. God accepts his simple, genuine, honest prayer. This man who was was wrecked before God, he went home justified. He went home spotless as if he had did everything wrong and nothing right. Notice how passive it is. It was something done to him, not by him. And notice it's past tense. It was done once and for all. God accepts us before we're good, you guys. He accepts us. He justifies us before we're good, not when we're good enough. Do you see this? Christians are not Christians because they are good enough. That's not what it means to be a Christian or to become a Christian. Christians are Christians because they've received God's mercy. Hard stop. That's it. So I don't know what you've done. But I do know that whatever it is, you are not beyond the reach of God's grace. You are not. His hand is not too short to save you. He can. There is no sin too great that Jesus did not die for. There's not a category of sin that he's like, "Uh, I don't do that one. So the last thing is a simple question, and that's simply this. How are you going to respond? How are you going to respond then to his grace today? How will you respond to his grace today that you're in need of and that is available for you? See, verse 14 again says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You guys, we're learning something here because we want to pray, God, your kingdom come. And so we learn here that when the kingdom of God comes in his fullness, when Jesus comes back, when that prayer that we've been praying for is fully answered for all eternity, there is going to be a humbling and an exalting of different people. You will either be humbled when he returns or you will be exalted. One day, every knee will bow. And one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we can either start bowing today, we can start confessing him as Lord today, or one day we will be humbled. 
and we will assume our rightful position on our knees. This is the future, and it's coming. And, and it, this is one of those things that is coming, and it's meant to invade your present. It's meant to invade your present. I did, there's so many things in life like this. I mean, if you've ever had a big pro, you know, presentation for work in the future, and you procrastinate, and then that day comes and you're like, oh man, I did not let the future invade my present. Maybe you had a big exam or paper and you procrastinated. The day arrives and you're very humbled, right? For me, full disclosure, I don't remember any of my dreams, okay? I'm one of those people. And I uh, don't really have nightmares. But when I do, I have a nightmare about this moment. <laughs> it's always I'm getting ready to come up and preach and someone's praying or Josue's wrapping up the song and I go, oh man, I forgot to prepare, <laughs> you know, to preach. What am I going to say, you know? And then you wake up and you're like, oh good, it's, you know, Wednesday or something, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, dr it's a horrible feeling, right? When you know something's coming and you don't let it invade your present, right? This is, this is the thing that you need to let invade your present. Right? Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. These are passive verbs, meaning that how you deal with Jesus, what you do with Jesus, who he is to you in this life, it will determine what God will do to you when you see him face to face. And you are held accountable for how you've lived. So here's the big question. If Jesus were to return right now, not before festi fall festival, but right now, <laughs> would he humble you or would he exalt you? Would he humble you or would he exalt you? Maybe he won't return today. I don't say this tritely, but, but we could all die today. And so if you were to die today, and you were to stand before your maker, and he were to say something to you about, why should I welcome you into my presence for all eternity? What would you say? The Pharisee would say, I've been a pretty good guy been really moral. I've believed the right things. I'm better than most people. His answer would be found in himself. But the tax collector would say, because I know you are a merciful God. Because I saw the blood dripping down the altar. Because I, I seen with the eyes of my heart Jesus dying on the cross and he's cleared out my locked room of guilt. And he bore it all. Guys, each one of us fits into these characters. And so if you were to stand before God today and you would begin your answer to his question as because I, because I, that tells you your confidence is in yourself. You're telling God that Jesus' death wasn't that necessary for you. Maybe it got the ball rolling or something. But a Christian's answer will always be, because Jesus. Because Jesus died for me. So how will you respond today? No response is a response. It is a response. So how will you respond? 